this is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Nash Tsunami podcast. This weekend, we are offering five conversations from Season 3, Episode 19, celebrating our second anniversary with new news about SurfingNash.com and Year 3 of Surfing the Nash Tsunami, followed by discussion of the retrospective analysis at Nail and IT. This conversation begins to focus on the specifics of the retrospective analysis inside Nail and IT. First, Naeem Al-Khoury and Jorn Schottenberg explain that the data for the retrospective analysis will come from, as Naeem puts it, five, six, even ten clinical trials, three phase threes and a bunch of phase twos done previously by drug developers. They then go on to describe some of the analyses that become feasible with this kind of data set. Project leader Mazen Nouradine then asks Naeem and Yorin to describe what he terms their, quote, passionate first projects, end quote. After they describe their projects, Naeem discusses the phrase intellectual yet idiot from Nassim Taleb's book Skin in the Game to describe some of the ways that seemingly intelligently designed NAS metrics actually defeat the purpose of properly identifying which patients are improving in clinical trials. This leads me to raise the issue again of the problems inherent in using a qualitative patient assessment method as a quantitative tool for determining whether a developmental drug is efficacious and the problems this has caused. Mazin closes the conversation by noting that opening clinical trial recruitment to patients who will not accept biopsy will be key in the coming years to have large enough patient pool to conduct all the trials we'll need as we seek to validate many new modes of action and combination therapies. It is really exciting to hear Stephen, Mazin, Yorn, and Naeem talk about their plans for nail and IT analysis. In conjunction with Litmus, Nimble, and the Goldline Project at UCSD, this is the stuff that will propel all of us beyond the biopsy in a scientifically credible, patient-sensitive way. So sit back, listen, enjoy, learn, and when you're done, join the dialogue on our LinkedIn and Facebook discussion groups. So what exactly, your Naeem, is the work that you're doing in the leadership role going to look like? And what are some of the things that you'll be going after? Naeem al As part of the clinical trials that we have been doing for the past few years, there's a, a lot of data that was generated uh, that can answer many relevant questions. The problem is we operate sometimes in silos and pharma companies are overprotective over the data for good reasons. But now we are seeing this potential to actually combine data from different pharma companies to answer the relevant questions to all of us. So one thing is, as Mazen said, all the NITs that are being done in clinical trials, can we combine data from five, six, ten clinical trials and look at them and see how they perform in comparison to liver biopsy, but also in comparison to each other and some of the scores that we've developed? Can we also look at the placebo response rate in different trials and try to get a deeper understanding at what's causing this variability, which can really sometimes kill your trial if you end up with a high placebo response rate. Can we look at NAS cirrhosis trials and see what are the reasons for screen failures in these uh, specific trials? Stephen has done a lot of work looking at reasons for screen failures in the non cirrhotic NASH trials, uh, but there is this unmet need to look specifically at NAS cirrhosis. So we have now this database and the willingness from different pharmaceutical companies to combine their data and try to answer some of these questions. We want to do this retrospectively first but then, of course, you know, we want to do it prospectively and get to a point where we actually can design trials without the need for liver biopsy. Jörn Schattenberg. Right on, Naeem. And he said it perfectly. There's so much data in the field and it's not being analyzed with the same rigorousness from the same perspective or the same angle. That's where the power of Nail and IT, in particular, starting out with the retrospective part here, comes in. Pulling together the baseline biopsies of these three, let's say, three phase three trials we're getting the data from and then additional phase two data trials and looking at differences, comparing this with placebo response rates, I think this will be crucially informing us uh, moving forward. Mazen Nureddin. Roger, can I jump in? So can I ask each one of you, (laughs) what would be your very first project? Like each one of you is the the one that's passionate about and what's your timeline for that? And I'm not asking you for a deadline for a paper or anything like that, I promise. But I'm just asking you about your uh, passionate first project? I'll go first, I guess. My first thing I want to do is to look at what thresholds are the ones that correspond to histologic response with different NITs. Uh, I have a special interest in corrected T1 as part of liver multi-scan and trying to validate what decrease in CT1 corresponds to improvement in the NAFLD activity score and NASH resolution. I'm also interested in looking at the MAST score and uh, validating this in a larger database and then looking at changes in 
and the mass core over time. This is Mazen's baby, but it's also dear to my heart. So I want to make sure that, you know, we validate this and look at the changes over time. Also looking at some of the scores that we generate with FibroScan. Examples are Agile 3 plus, Agile 4, and looking at longitudinal changes over time and seeing if we can use them as a way to also monitor response. Very ambitious, Naeem. Great projects. Stephen Harrison. I think I think you did a great job answering <laughs> your, your, your question, Mazen. For somebody that's got two baby girls, MAST is too bold to be a girl. It's a boy. So now you have a baby boy <laughs> named Mass that uh, Naeem is going to help bring into adulthood. Yeah, sounds like a mustache. Uh, so. <laughs> Mazen, before Yorn answers your question, I want you to know that between some of the questions that I hear Yorn ask from time to time, the questions you're asking, I can go on vacation now. I'm not taking over it, Roger. I promise. I'm gonna give it. I'm gonna give it ba back to you. But I'm starting the projects on this broadcast. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep you busy, man. Yorn, how about your baby? Yeah, I, you know, I think <laughs> I, I do like to understand some of the differences in the effect size we're seeing across trials. I'm really excited about pulling this data sets together and looking at more than one. Now, there's some hurdles to that because slightly changed inclusion, exclusion, maybe different pathologists reading slides and so on. But I think it's something where the, the placebo response is planned out nicely. So I think this is one of my first aspects. And it's something I, I think I mentioned to Stephen sitting next to him in a litmus meeting in, in Spain somewhere a long time ago. We were discussing how is the placebo, how come that is different in these trials. I think that was in Barcelona. And I think that's where I'll see you again in two yes. weeks or something. Yes. Right. And see the corresponding effect size of the NITs next to that. That's really something I'm interested in. Roger, if I may say something, hopefully no one will find this offensive, but I was reading this book called Skin in the Game by Nassim Talib. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Yes. He wrote also Black Swan. He talks about these situations he calls intellectual yet idiot. Okay, I-Y-I. And the idea is that sometimes we get too intellectual that the, the end result is really just counterproductive. And I was thinking about it in the context of Nash. And I'll give you some examples that I really hope that Nail and IT will get us out of. Number one is in clinical trials, as Mazin said earlier, we have patients that show up with liver biopsy with F3, and they have steatosis 1, inflammation 1, and no ballooning, or sometimes even more inflammation. So the NAS could be 3, even 4, but there's zero ballooning. And then we cannot enroll these patients in trials because they don't have technically Nash, because they don't have ballooning. And that patient is F3 probably too. F3, exactly. So if you think about it, Roger, the whole reason why we have NASH is because NASH is considered the aggressive, progressive form of the disease. But if someone has F3, what else do you need to call it an aggressive disease, right? So now we have this situation where we cannot enroll these patients in trials. If insurance restricts to, you know, trials and meeting the criteria for the phase three, how can you include these patients? Do we need to do now investigator-initiated studies and include these patients in a separate uh, trial and then not allow ballooning? It just doesn't make any sense. So I think this is one situation that NITs will help us move past and just never have to worry about ballooning on a biopsy. The second scenario is the whole NASH resolution and the requirement of ballooning zero. It, it just doesn't make any sense to take someone with, let's say, S2, ballooning one, inflammation one, and if they go to S1, ballooning zero, and inflammation one, now we call it NASH resolution, and this is a great outcome, as opposed to someone starting with NAS of eight, let's say S3, ballooning two, inflammation three, if they go to S1, ballooning 1, and zero inflammation, we cannot call it NASH resolution. I think patient 2 improved much more than patient 1. And patient 1 could have been just, you know, pathologist variation and saying there's ballooning or not. So this is another scenario that we made it so complicated, it just doesn't make any sense. And we sometimes talk too much about evidence base and we need the data and this and that, but I don't underestimate the power of just thinking about the scenarios and saying, okay, whatever we have is just just not helping us answer these scenarios and we need to use a more logical and rational approach. I think the data that will be generated in NAIL and IT will, will help us get out of these IYI situations. Naeem, that's great. And I want to thank you for teaching me one important thought about all this. And then I've got a question for you guys based on kind of my background. Uh, the thought is Naeem pointing out that we've made these rules based on no data or no realistic data, but that you need tons of data to turn them over, which would strike me as a, 
extraordinarily good example of IOII thinking. I mean, there was an episode where you're talking about things that we've done that were proved and accepted that were never proven. But now you have to disprove them to get away from them. And the data never existed to do that in the first place. So at one point, you said we had better data on a lot of NITs right now than we had on biopsy when biopsy was accepted the way it was as a standard, if I recall your statement correctly. I think it's important for us to keep in mind how a lot of this stuff came about. And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we had uh, the balloon hepatocyte episode in the context of semi-quantitative and quantitative. It feels to me from the outside end happened is the ways back. People looked at things that made sense when treating individual patients, turned them into rules for larger patient populations. And the statistically, the rules didn't make any sense. And logically, they didn't make sense across a cohort of people, even if they made sense for individuals. And I think the examples you gave are a couple of those. When we go from semi-quantitative to quantitative by making greater use of AI, we're eliminating one source of error, but it still isn't clear that we're looking at the right targets because very smart people talking to each other can talk themselves into lots of things that don't make sense. What kinds of effort will you be able to make retrospectively to question whether these are actually the right targets in the first place? For example, using your name, whether we just shouldn't be looking at ballooning or we should be thinking about ballooning in a very different way. How can these kinds of analyses get at that level of question? Before they also comment, I just want to follow up on your comment, Roger and Naeem. I want to talk about also tomorrow. I mean, we talked about it a little bit, but we're complaining about the biopsy and ballooning and all this, but we all want this field to be successful. And let's say there are now four or five, oh, actually we already have four or five, but let's say we have 10 MOAs that are now in phase three, which is great because we're going to combine them in the future and control the disease. But now you have 10 MOA, the smallest trial you can do is 800 probably to 1,000 and 2,000 patients. And you're biopsying all these patients. People were not going to accept to go to biopsy study. The field will not move unless if we look at different way, which is what we're trying to do. Two, the cardiac outcomes, we kind of like shoved it under the rug for now. And we try to do it here and there, but also we need to look at that in the future of phase three trial. Now we're too fixated on the biopsy, but as the drugs come, there will be a real need, like the, the type two diabetes field, they do trials in the thousands and thousands and look at cardiac outcome and kidney outcomes. And those are all important in our field. So that's part of the, I guess, what you said, Stephen, the touchdown approach with the football. And now back to Roger. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please send an email to questions at surfingnash.com. We'll be back next week to learn a little more about our new full-time co-host, Jorn, and to check in with a couple of our favorite guest surfers. Until then, stay safe, surf on. We'll see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now.